Welcome back, and Chris Harris is here, our nuclear expert, with the latest update on Fukushima, and we have some specific numbers, uh, some very good, a very good article here. Chris, what's the latest, and what are what are these other uh, journalists picking up? And of course, many of these stories we have done several years ago. They're now picking up and giving uh, more technical details of how many fuel rod assemblies they've removed of the different classes, and what are the specific dangers, such as what's called re-criticality, re hyphen criticality, which means new nuclear uh, out of control reactions that can either cause a power fork fire or an explosion. Uh, this is not good. These this, these are kind of euphemistic words for run like hell, <laughs> and you can't clear the, clear the building. Uh, you know what's the latest? What's going on? Okay, Doctor Bill, uh, good to talk to you again. Yeah, and thank you for letting me perform a little update here. Uh, I just wanted to start off with Unit Four, Fukushima Unit Four to uh, date, at least at, uh, as of Monday, 506 of the spent fuel or 506 of the fuel uh, elements that have been removed from the uh, Unit 4 spent fuel pool, but uh, there's still 1,027 to go. And so uh, there's still a long way to go, and all the uh, all the dangers and everything that we've talked about in the past are still existing right now, and I just wanted to give you an update. It's slow going, and... Uh, so right now we still have over a thousand left to go, and it's going to take a long time. Well, the, one, okay. the thousand left are in, are much more damaged, much more out of control. It's very likely that much of the fuel rod pellets are actually on the bottom of the of this light bulb shaped uh, containment vessel called a PCV. And as you mentioned on the break, that the outside ring, which is a ring shaped area, is the most likely from heating temperatures higher than the actual melting point of the steel and the seal at the edge of the PCV. Are likely to break uh, with time and the neutron annealing of the crystal structure. So uh, between the, the chances of an earthquake, which are by the way higher risk now around the spring equinox, <clears throat> subsidence which can cause the buildings to fall over, or just time that can anneal the materials or break the seal, uh, there's multiple pathways to catastrophe here and they're all active. Yeah, I guess there's a, uh, well, I suppose if the, if the seal, now I'm going back to the spent fuel pool, that's what's holding up the level, the spent fuel pool level, which is actually a seal that goes around the reactor flange, and it seals the water off between the reactor flange and the um, uh, in, inter, interior, upper interior of the uh, pressure containment vessel. Now, going to the other article, uh, we have right here that they that uh, they're talking about because uh, they don't really know where the fuel is and some of the some of the schemes to take the fuel out involve uh, flooding the entire contained pressure vessel, uh, which causes its own problems. I guess if that seal ever broke, you you know you flood the containment vessel, but uh, you kill two birds with one stone. You flood the containment vessel, but then again you also drain the spent fuel pool, so that's no good. You can't do that. Um, but we don't want to do that. So I, I just wanted to dovetail a little bit into the second article that I had sent you, which was a press release translated. It took a little while to translate. I didn't do the translation uh, from uh, from NHK News from Japanese into English. And let me just read a little bit. This was uh, an email as of March 10th. They talked about defueling the molten core debris should start six years from now at the earliest. Six years from now. Just a second now, roll back, defueling the molten core six years from now? What what, what are they, what leap in technology do they expect to appear on the screen magically that allow them to defuel it? And we talked about this with the critical different technological reports we recommended, which by the way, I'm going to do a summary, which will be posted here and also on rents, and they'll be able to purchase the ebook directly from us, uh, probably as initially as a disc that we'll generate, and then as an ebook, which will also be on Kindle. Which include your emails back and forth with your radio name, Chris, and uh, all the technical questions we ask because it's citizen scientists like us that actually are going to push this forward. And, uh, you know, I, I think people need to realize that there's two sides to this. We have the technical things to control and stop and reverse the problem, and there's a bunch of yahoos out there too that are trying to say that they know how to do it. Uh, sorry, we need to take off the shelf and use innovative technologies. But there's a lot of people out there. I, I had some strange emails. I had one from a person about a guy, Patrick Flanagan. They think he's a reincarnation of Tesla. And then I had this Dr. Apsley who's going to do this clinic this coming Saturday uh, and Sunday in uh, in uh, Austin, Texas. 
no one's showing me exactly what they think they're doing. If they have a valid idea, send it to me. But I don't believe any of this hoo-ha. It's real simple. Your two enemies are neutrons and water. And if you stick to the basics of that, you can stop this problem. Yes, it may be a future of technology of the idea of shattering the subatomic nuclei and, and using that to break uh, isotopes up. That's technology that's probably many years away, or if it's hidden deep in the infrastructure of Warehouse 13, they're not going to tell us. So uh, let's stick to basics, like our hydraulic and, and, uh, and pneumatic robots about uh, shielding against gamma rays and uh, neutrons so workers can actually work around there, which they can't now. Let's talk about actually fixing the problem instead of compounding it. And so all these, uh, I say all comers, if you think you have something better, email it to me and call me. But until then, I see a lot of grinning, smiling fools that don't know what the heck they're talking about. And there's a lot of scientists that then said the dark side, like I heard the latest from Arnie Gunderson, it'll be 100 years before we get control of this. We don't have 100 years. We don't have five years. If we don't get control of this in the next year or so, North America and the northern population of, of this world will, within probably five to ten years, it will be very daunting to even consider having a child, number one. And number two, the rate of cancer in every disease you can think of. People think, well, the main thing is going to be cancer. No, you'll be lucky if you live long enough to get cancer. You'll get every other disease imaginable, including immune suppression, major plagues. No, we don't have five years. We don't have ten years. We don't have twenty years. We've got to do this in the next year or so. We're done. <clears throat> if we don't get control of this issue, we need a different government. We don't have a leader in the United States government. We don't have a leader in the IAEA. We don't have leadership in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to actually just kind of saying, what the heck? You know, you're, you're brave enough to actually, under a radio name, come on and tell us technically what needs to be done and actually analyze the news. But this is not happening elsewhere. And I hear even comments by top physicists like Mishukaku, and he talks in platitudes and how bad it is, and some people talk about how many Hiroshima's per hour this is doing. That doesn't help the problem. The actual problem, we do not need to exaggerate it or make what we call mis-exaggerations when parts of it are far more serious than Chernobyl by thousands of times, when parts of it are, are different than the above-ground nuclear testing. So when people make statements like Dr. Chris Busby that, oh, it's only going to increase the amount of uh, you know atmospheric radiation by X amount and it's equivalent. No, it's totally different. And we need to realize we have people that are speaking out of their area of sphere of expertise and making projections without data. We need data. We, can, we are being smothered to death with no data. And the people that could generate data, like Dr. Kai Vetter, choked off the data a year and a half ago and started to put out this idea of a kelp study, and it's obscene and makes me angry as hell that this kind of statement that the data is already not even, the test samples aren't even in from these 18 different universities on the kelp along the western coast of the United States and Canada and America uh, and Canada, but yeah, he's already pronouncing that it's all fine and go back to sleep. And I don't want to hear this kind of crap anymore. I don't want to hear scientists say how wonderful they are. I want solid ideas, solid technical answers, and I don't want garbage. I don't want to have horse hockey. I am sick and tired of people that stand on their platitudes of their celebrity status or their PhDs or whatever, and they won't answer questions. Your comments, uh, Chris? Uh, well, my team... I had to blow that off. I get so angry by people who pretend they're so damn smart. Prove it to me. Prove it to me. Prove it to me, smarty. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the re I guess one of the reasons why I guess the, uh, well, I guess members of my team and then, and then I decided to come, come out with... Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're, you and your uh, team are helping me behind the scenes. Thank God, because you know what? We're the only avenue. In fact, I talked to Dr. William Ray, the head of our Academy of Environmental Medicine. Our show that we do on Thursday afternoon is the main source of information for the Academy and Dr. Ray to find out what the heck is happening in Fukushima. And when I go on Rents Network, on, and also in Yuichi Shimatsu is on Monday nights, which you missed the last few weeks, and I had to do Monday. Well, Chris, uh, after my little rant there, let's get into some more details of this Fukushima thing, because... Uh, what we see here, and I actually saw an interesting show, uh, the, listen, uh, listen to an interesting interview the other day, and I'll try to get that expert on as well, uh, dealing with these issues of preparedness. The likelihood, if we get into a shooting war with Syria, Iran, or Russia, of an EMP taking out our uh, backup power for nuclear reactors, and we talked about this before, is unbelievably daunting. 
we have forty. Uh, we have around twenty five hundred <clears throat> step down transformers, and there's these are big enough that you actually have to shut down the highways and freeways to pull the damn things through. And the average wait now, because they're building power lines all over the world, is three years. It used to be one year. They are made all in China now. Don't, we don't manufacture any of these step down transformers. We could put in for about one to two billion dollars uh, what's called the surge protectors that would go to ground if there's a, either a military or cybernetic CME or a space based plasma discharge or what's called a gravity wave, which can occur as the star enters the event horizon of the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Most people don't realize that a, a, a gravity wave will do the exact same thing as a coronal mass ejection. Okay? And you can, by the way, get an EMP also from the crash of a large comet that even crashes through the upper troposphere. So when the Tunguska event happened in the early 20th century, that caused an EMP, and if there's any advanced electronics around, it would have fried them to pieces just by entering the atmosphere, producing an EMP from the impact. Uh, we're not ready for that. We're not ready for cybernetic attacks from the Tianjin China Blue Army, the cybernetic army, the Iranians, or Russians. In fact, we went tit for tat already. There's been cybernetic kind of tit for tat warfare already last week between America and Russia and the NSA. <clears throat> we're not ready for that. Uh, what would happen if backup power went out for all of the reactors in America? Chris. Uh, and if, if fuel couldn't be brought to the diesel generators in, in uh, seven days, well, then we're out of luck. That we're out of plants but, be the plant. How, how far out of luck? Are we, are, no. are we talking about, uh, you know, get down on your hands and knees and get ready to meet Jesus, uh, kind of out of luck, or... You're going to glow for a while out of luck, or don't have children out of luck, or you're going to get cancer eventually out of luck, or you're going to die I, I, in 48 hours kind of out of luck. Well, uh, what, maybe maybe second what, to the last one. Maybe, yeah, in other words, you're going to die one. really fast probably before your next birthday, in other words, kind of out of luck. Yeah, but <clears throat> I was just reading I was just reading that uh, uh, the, the grid, if, if, if you took out eight of eight special or specific uh, substations, uh, the whole grid can go down for a long time. Well, I just read that as an article. Yeah, in, in other words, eight of the 2,500, if they go down, eight, just only eight, which could happen very easily, even from a partial, which is called a glancing coronal mass ejection and a magnetic storm, uh, which is very doable. You're talking about up to a three year wait for the parts, and that's if we have a good uh, kind of congenial relationship with China, which right now isn't exactly happy with America's behavior. They're backing Russia. And the alliances are building to say, all they need to say is like what I call the soup Nazis, you know, from Seinfeld, no step down transformer for you. <laughs> and that's and then we're done. Bye. I mean, they say, well, America, you know, hey, what are you going to do now for your uh, nuclear reactors? You didn't move your fuel off site. You didn't even have container. See, see, here in America, it's not law that they have to move all their fuel rod assemblies to what's called container storage. They put them in cooling pools and then park them there forever. That's too crazy, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's one thing I did read about that. You know, I'm kind of a devilish kind of guy also, always looking for, uh, you know, I, I, you know, big industrial accidents. Well, I always like to see what they are because then we can prevent others with them. I, so I, I, well, I, the question I, I have is why when I found that out, what, Chris, before I get further, why would they even pass years ago because of the nuclear lobby that they didn't have to have all their fuel rods transferred out to what's called permanent and stable container storage that then you can get off-site? Why? Why did they allow them to just have these giant cooling pools just sitting there with 40 and 50 years of fuel percolating away, ready to get hit with a dirty bomb, a drone blown in, uh, you know, and if, if, even if they lose backup power here to San Onofre, which is 12 miles from us, that reactor can go critical and blow up. Plus, they got 50 oh, some years of fuel on board sitting by it <clears throat> that basically contains more radioisotopes than all the nuclear above ground testing in history. And equivalent to many times the amount of radioisotopes that would be released from a third world war. Just at one site. We're not even talking about all the reactors, which are over 500 in the world. This is what I call humanicide, omnicide. It's just nuts. And even the simple things technically to be done to make it safe, like having you know, better backup generators, having a year of fuel on board in a container nearby, making sure you have your power lines run four or five miles inland, from the coastal areas where most of these reactors are, so that they run to a higher altitude and you have special dedicated power lines to make sure the the, the, the cooling does never stops. If they simply did that in Fukushima, it couldn't matter if it was swamped, it would still have the backup generators going two or three miles inland. 
above the site where the tsunami would have rolled across the land. It would be fine. But none of those things were thought about, and they aren't super expensive, just like one to two billion to protect the the, the power grid from a CME or a cyber attack. <clears throat> so well, I think we're just yeah, asking just for think- trouble. It's like it's like driving 150 miles an hour on a road that's rated at 35 on a dirt road. You're going to die, and you're going to spin around first and tumble head over heels in your vehicle before you impact and before you get beheaded and your limbs get torn off and you bleed to death within two or three minutes or less. So I hope you have a fun ride before that happens. <clears throat> it would be one heck of a ride. But you know, we're going to make a, we're going to make a what's called a face plant to hell. How's that? Yeah, there's a lot of road rash. But uh, <laughs> I guess uh, they they didn't tell us specifically which which of those substations to take out. I guess that would have been irresponsible if they said, you know, you can take out these eight. I'm glad they didn't say that. Okay. So. <laughs> well, I, I, for, first off, the easiest way to take out substations is take them out where you have, uh, have don't have redundancy in power backup lines. Because there's parts of the country that have backup power redundancy lines. Take them out in areas where there's extreme weather or where there's areas where there's, uh, uh, you know, a minor, higher likelihood of, say, a, a, uh, an earthquake. And we know that even hydrofracking was occurring beside the WIP reactor. I'm pretty certain that the WIP reactor uh, site in New Mexico, uh, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, was actually compromised by the hydrofracking, which I think is also nuts. Why are they hydrofracking with chemicals that sucks the water away from trees? Number one, number two, it poisons the water table, and number three, makes even the ground unstable in these salt mines where they're storing nuclear material from all the spent nuclear weapons they have. How stupid is that? I mean, these are just basic questions, and I'm certain if they did ground penetrating radar, they could track out that they'd know exactly which hydrofracking and in which direction was actually degrading the integrity of the salt floor and ceiling in that WIP reactor site. I'm certain that they could do these tests and tell you in about two hours exactly where it is. You could do what's called geophysical analysis, and it puts currents through the earth, and you can tell where water is, where oil is. You can tell what depth. You can even see the, the actual structure of the specific faults, etc. All of that data can be generated. And I know I've talked to engineers recently. There's no excuse for not knowing exactly why that WIP site became unstable. Well, not only that, but they know that before they start. I mean, before they get approval to do tracking, there's a geologist that actually provides all kinds of reports. And somebody who's, approved it anyway. Let's put it that way. Who's watching the watchers, though? Who watches the NRC? Who watches the IAEA? Who watches TEPCO? And by the way, I found out something else new, that all the CEOs of TEPCO are all American. Did you know that? All the different sub-departments. They're all subcontracted. They're all American. Every single one of them. Sure. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Not American, American corporations. Yeah, they're all and, and run by Americans. In other words, if you go to TEPCO, it's just an umbrella corporation, and it's hired, subcontracted to all these American corporations that the sub-managers are all American. So when we look well, at TEPCO, we say, oh, those Japanese are so stupid. No, no, those are subcontracted American corporations that are stupid because their bottom line is what counts, not the lives of Japanese or Americans or anybody in the Northern Hemisphere. <clears throat> Nasty, yeah. hey? Well, Nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, mindset, you know, and that's, that's what we have. You're right, and and of course, who's who's watching the watchers? Well, who's watching the watchers? I guess that's it's a bad one. Industry, isn't it? industry, and 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 the regulators run for who, as far as I'm concerned. From what I see, nobody now, wants to step on each other's toes. Well, they need I a think, jump from a great height and break those toes. Five hundred six out of fifteen hundred thirty-three fuel rod assemblies have been transferred. There's a breakdown. Can you that breakdown shows? Uh, 484 assemblies out of 1331 of the spent fuel and the unirradiated or new fuel 20 uh, basically 22 assemblies out of 202 and the number of times of cask transport 23 times uh, every time you I move a the, cask you've got to you've got to every time you move a cask you have the risk of dropping one and and wrecking the entire structure every single time right so, uh, yep. I, I'm As I'd say with player, multiple yeah. chances of if I was going with Vegas with the odds of Fukushima, I would walk out a billionaire. It's going to blow, as they say. You know, when Moby Dick was there, you know that movie, Moby Dick? Mm-hmm. It's going to blow. I'd say uh, we have yeah. the spring uh, equinox coming and earthquakes. We've got subsidence. We've got stupid management. We have them now building an ice wall around it. I mean, it's like the Keystone Cops. It's crazy. It's obscene, it's angerating, and the so-called people think they're so smart, call into the show. Show us how smart you are, how innovative. Come on. We 
need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.